fortunate today to have Mary Turrell and Emma Craddock, who are going to be talking about that um, program. And so let me give you a little bit of background about our two speakers, and then I'll introduce them. Uh, Mary Turrell is the Executive Director of the Global Institute of Sustainable Forestry at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. In this role, she serves as director for the Sustaining Family Forest Initiative. Her work focuses on land use change, forest fragmentation, sustainable forest management, and U.S. private land, with a particular emphasis on the review and synthesis of scientific research and making scientific information available to forest managers, policy makers, and conservationists. And Emma, Kravit is the program manager for the Sustaining Family Forest Initiative. She has a dual MA, MS in Urban and Environmental Policy and Planning and Agriculture, Food and Environment from the Tufts University. She has previously worked in Food and Agricultural Policy, Youth Development, and Farm Based Education. So, welcome to Mary and Emma. And what 
we're going to be talking about here a lot is what we call social marketing, targeted marketing. That's sort of the bottom line of what it's all about. How do you influence landowners' behavior? How do, how do you persuade landowners to do what you want them to do, which is in your interest, but also has to be in their interest? So how do you figure that out? How do you figure if, if what you're trying to get them to do is not in their interest, it's not going to work. So you need to figure out who are the landowners most likely do what's also in their interest. Right? And so that's what that whole two-day workshop is all about. The Sustainability Forest Initiative, I mentioned, is a partnership um, right now um, uh, it's between the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, which is Emma and I. We're a very lean and mean organization. Uh, the U.S. person is Brett Butler, who's from the National Little Owners Survey. He's the one who produces all the data we use, and he's also an extremely valuable member of our team in terms of how to take that and actually put it into action. And two people from the Center for Nonprofit Strategies, Karina Machalwa and Avi Singh. So, uh, and they bring the social marketing, communications expertise, also strategic planning, they're very uh, much focused on that as well. <coughs> so when you got to the two-day workshop, the facilitators would be Emma, myself, Perna, my and Bobby. Um, but Brett's presence is always with us because it's, uh, he's such a big uh, influence on our team, but he's not going to be at the workshop. Um, let's see, what else do I have to say here? Okay, you all have workbooks. If you don't have one, there are extras hanging around. Uh, we're not going to talk much about this today. If you come to the two-day workshop, please bring this with you because we produced only enough of this, uh, for everybody who's going to be at that workshop. As well. um, if you're not going to be at the workshop and you're here today, um, and you like the workshop, just sort of let us know. Our work will let us know, so we'll figure out if we have a few extras. Um, if you can look through this before you come, it will be helpful. It's helpful to you, a little bit helpful to us. Okay, uh, we're still going to go over everything, but um, it would be nice if you looked through this ahead of time. Uh, just get a, sort of an idea of what's going to happen. The, the training program, so the content is the same as what's in the workbook. We don't always follow it exactly, but it is the same content. This is also available on our website, engagingLandowners.org. Um, you can also look on there. If you look on the website, you'll find landowner data. Uh, the data is from 2006, so it's not exactly current. When we show up in three weeks, four weeks, what do you think? Yeah. we're going to uh, bring new data with us, the 2013 data. It's not released yet, but it's still good. Um, so you'll have a new data on that date. Yeah, okay. I think that's all I wanted to say in terms of providing you now. Where's, Mary, where's that going to be held? It's going to be held at Westchester Land Trust at the Sugar Hill Farm headquarters in Edmund Hill. Oh, good. Everybody hear that? That's just a land trust, sugar. Farm. Farm. Hills. 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 Okay. Okay. So we use the term, uh, the term social marketing and the term targeted marketing, we use them fairly interchangeably. Uh, at the workshop, Carla is going to, she is the expert in this, she's going to talk a lot about this and, and sort of background and how all that came about. Um, we don't need social media when we talk about social marketing. Right. We mean uh, targeting your marketing. Because what you're doing, you're marketing to landowners, right? That's what you're doing, whether you want to admit it or not. You're marketing a program, a product, a behavior, or something you want them to do. Um, and social marketing means we take into account the context of the landowner, who they are, what their values are, what their lifestyle is like, uh, what their objectives are for their land, for their family and everything else that gets involved. Some of these are huge decisions. Um, a conservation easement is, a, as you know, an enormous decision. Much bigger than, you know, maybe improving bird habitat on the property. So um, all of that context has to be taken into account. And then uh, you focus in a targeted way on, as I said earlier, those landowners who are more likely to 
take on your behavior. And when you put out any kind of materials, announcements, whatever you're going to do for your marketing, um, you need to keep that in mind. When the landowner sees something, whether it's a little bit in the newspaper, a local paper, or a flyer or somewhere, they have to look at that and say, wow, I'm interested in that. Or they have to, not just say this, but what they mean is like, oh, they're talking to me. So that's what we're going to work on a lot during the workshop. Um, the, the workshop, maybe I'll explain a little bit more. The morning of the, of the larger workshop will be us talking to you all about social marketing and, and why we do all this, uh, a lot about the data. We'll go into it more detail than we do today. Uh, from then on, you break into your work groups. You have projects, specific things you're working on in those groups. And uh, we'll be hands-on facilitating, working you through how you actually work through a communication plan for the other. How do you figure out what your objectives are and tie it in with what their objectives are? How do you define your audience? How do you, we call profile them, bad word, but that just means everything you know about them. And that takes into account everything. It takes into account data, takes into account everything you just know because you work in that area, you know people like that, and so forth. Um, then, what's your message? What's, what, what are you going to really appeal to them with? How are you going to get it out to them? What are the right channels? And then what are the right materials to put in those channels? And finally, my favorite part, how do you evaluate whether you're effective or not? And how do you evaluate whether your process is effective and whether your outcomes are happening? So your process means you, are, you advertise a workshop, how many people show up and are they the right people? That's your process measure. Your outcome measure is, is somebody actually, you know, having um, civil cultural treatment for a changing bird habitat on their property, or do somebody actually put a conservation? I'm probably way ahead of myself. So. Okay, just I, and so I want to show you some examples of uh, social marketing. They're designed to persuade people to take on particular behaviors, right? And this smoky bear, the Forest Service is icon. It's a social marketing program. But who is it aimed at? Okay. Who's the audience? Everyone. Everybody. Everybody, right? So in that way, it's not particularly targeted. <clears throat> well, we're trying, if you're trying to bring out specific change in behavior with a specific group of people, you need to be more targeted. This is a stop myth ad. These ads are incredibly effective. Who is this targeted at? Meth user, but what kind of meth user? Teens. Yeah. Teens. Teens. Absolutely. If you go on their website and look at their ads, this is the least disturbing picture I can find. <laughs> really, some of them are really un unbelievable. This has been extremely effective, but they started in Montana. I think they did the This is a very targeted. If you're not a teen using meth, you're not going to pay any attention to this. And the people who are doing this don't care. They're not, they're not trying to attract your attention. OK, so what's effective outreach? Effective outreach has to be strongly linked to your program goals. Right? Because that's what you're trying to do. <laughs> so um, it doesn't make any sense to, to work with landowners on doing things that aren't eventually going to get them to you, helping you meet your goals. And that doesn't mean immediately. There's probably some steps along the way. Maybe you go a little sideways with some groups of landowners because that's the way to hook them in, which is fine. But always keep in mind where we head. It has to be behavior focused. This is where um, the groups we work with often struggle the most. When you set objectives, what do you, what do you, like, you have a workshop. What do you want the landowner to do when they leave that workshop? What's the next thing you want them to do? It can't be just, oh, we're going to come and tell them about something. OK, fine. Then what? Um, and it has to be targeted. So we have all kinds of uh, messages out there for landowners. And these are just some of them. Um, often, these are designed as if this is the entire landowner population. 
It just works really well with forestry agencies because it's like, okay, they all look like you, right? <laughs> and that is, I mean, that's a, that's a human nature to think that. Hey, you know, you know uh, people are all like me, right? Well, they're not, right? They're very diverse in terms of their objectives, their lifestyle, you know, their family situation, um, what they feel about their land, why they own their land, what they want to do with it, their financial situation, and they're just this diverse in all kinds of ways. And that's what we're going to help you work with, work through, is how to sort through all this diversity and figure out, okay, who do I start with who's most likely to start doing the kind of things that we want to do with our land. I gave this is I show this slide. I've done a, a special uh, uh, study on Connecticut landowners, and I love to show this slide. And I say, okay, everything you need to know about Connecticut landowners, you got right here. Right? What do you see here? What does that mean? Here, wildlife. Oh yeah. So yeah, it could be the way. It could be they don't want bears in their backyard. Or it could be I love wildlife. What else? Everybody's Hey. <laughs> Bird life. Bird life. Birds. Yeah. Family. Family, right? Firewood. Firewood. Yeah, firewood's big. I'm not sure about your area in particular. You know that when we do, but generally you can get firewood big. Old age. Old age. <laughs> yeah, they're older. A lot of them older. Yeah. What else? Yeah, none of them look like the guy in the previous slide. So none of them look like they're state forest today. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, outside, uh, somebody said fishing, recreation. recreation, and this one, everybody misses this. Oh. It's their home. <laughs> no, they're not home. Only. This is their home. It's where they live. It's their lifestyle. You've got to keep that in mind always. So landowners are going to differ on a number of factors. These are sort of, you can condense them, reasons why they own their woodland, what they do with it, activities, uh, attitudes towards active management, right? Um, lifestyles and demographics. These are sort of big areas where that landowners are going to differ and you can take into account. So if you're trying to do um, have a very outside improvement, uh, you need what for 25 acres or more, right? I need to do silvicultural treatments. Well, we in the forestry lingo know what that means. You all know what that means? No, of course not. A lot of you don't. You're in land forestry. It means cutting trees. Sometimes a lot of trees. So if you've got people who have a leave it alone, I don't want to cut trees on my land, attitudes of active management, even though they love wildlife and that's why they own their land, you're going to have a tough match with trying to get improved bird habitat sometimes. Or New England cottontail, right? Forget that. You have to have clear cuts of 10 acres. <laughs> okay. Um, so, again, I've, I've said this before, you need to target your outreach. The landowners are most likely to take on your desired behavior and have the greatest impact on your program goals. And hopefully, this is a good match. Hopefully, their population is big enough for these two things. And sometimes it may not be. So then, okay, you've got a high priority area and you've got low numbers of landowners likely to take on your behavior. You need to take on. Well, that's okay. You just need to know that. You need to think about it carefully. You need to work your strategies with that in mind. Okay, and uh, a big part of, um, of, of all this is uh, you can connect to shared values, and that works quite well. You can solve their problems. That's always the easiest, right? And I use invasive species as a good example. So if landowners are really concerned about invasives on their property, you can work with them to help them manage those invasives, and at the same time, you can work in some of your own goals, and eventually you can get them thinking, maybe you're about a conservation commitment. Because you started 
to something that they see as a problem. And they see you as helping them solve it. You can also appeal to the sense of, sense of social self, which is tough, but not impossible. And maybe just should be a subtext sometimes. Um, what we know about the data from Connecticut, and I apologize because I don't have a lot of data from New York, but we will have that in the workshop, um, is that a really high percentage, 88 or so percent of Connecticut landowners say that what they do on their land has a, and conserving their land, has an impact well beyond their community environment. So they, they you know, their, their sense of social self is pretty important in their landowners. Mary? Yeah. Question. So, about uh, Bill Ed with Heisted. And so, are you saying that, uh, say, a message or or a, a marketing effort that would help people see that they're part of something bigger, something that's meaningful to them, but bigger at scale, involve a large region to be a, a valuable marketing hook? I do say that's true. Not the only hook, right. but a, as, a, as a part of the. <laughs> Their program, yes, I think it definitely works in Connecticut. We'll look at the New York data, and, um, and, and uh, I would guess it's the same, at least in this part of New York. I don't, I wouldn't guess it'd be too much different. And that's not true everywhere. There are places in the country we've done focus groups where we test this out, and people are, like, mm -hmm. I don't care about that. So that's why you need to know these things. Probably. <laughs> so that's the other thing. In your, maybe you know people that you know, you know in your town. Um, you have to be realistic. And we'll talk a lot about that at the other workshop. And avoid jargon. <coughs> Don't talk about civil cultural treatments. How am I doing today? So we're going to work through these. I mentioned these before at the workshop. Six basic questions. What's your objective? Who's your audience? What's your know about them? What's going to appeal to them? What channels and materials? And how will you evaluate them? Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the landowners, what we know about them, and then we'll take over from here. Um, there are 4.1 billion people across the country who own almost 300 million acres of forest land. These are people who own 10 or more acres of forest land, not, not the smaller urban suburban plots. And these are the folks who focus on 10 plus acres. Okay. Um, so for this survey, the cooperation rate is 
So of folks who actually received the survey, 43% took the survey. Um, the survey is aimed at uh, understanding the attitudes, behaviors, and demographics of landowners. So things that we're trying to get at are who are the landowners, why do they own land, how have they used it, and how do they intend to use it. So again, as Mary mentioned, the, the data that we use for Kelly is based on 10 plus paper parcels. Uh, which gives us a total of 8,450 responses. Um, so now I'm just going to show you some of the data. Um, when we do the two-day workshop, we're going to gonna go much more into that. But, okay, so this is uh, from the 2011-2013 data. Um, this is reasons for owning woodland. So if we want to communicate with landowners effectively, we really need to know what's important to them. So generally speaking, what don't you see at the top of the list? Conservation. I heard conservation. Yeah. Money. Yeah. I think sometimes that surprises us. Yeah, we don't see our financial residents. Uh, what resonates strongly with landowners throughout the U.S. is aesthetics, legacy, privacy. Um, these are all things towards the top of the list. Um, anyone else see something interesting or surprising here? The water is low. Thank you. 
pretty far down the road. Yeah, climate change is, is pretty far down. Do you think that holds true for your region? Any sense? I think it's because they don't understand what climate change is or what it does. Um, just a sidebar question. So, property owners have been cost of more acres. Um, are those only private individuals or does that include organization non profit? Those are private uh, family forest owners that do not include them. Um, the other organizations get surveys because they're any private that anybody gets a survey, but the data is separated out. Actually, he's never been able to report on data from sort of NGOs, you know, all the way to you all, and so forth. So, I mean, you need that survey. This is only for us. So um, this is pretty good news for uh, making sure we end up 
with this picture what we see on the beach. Any thoughts on this? Anyone surprised?
their ability to cut timber that were they way more cut timber would be not like, you know, in their, not just in the South, but anywhere. Often it's to do with timber management. They don't want um, state regulations, for example, um, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, question. Can you have the attitude of a supplemental income landowner but not actually um, achieve having, you know, income from your land? Could you have the attitude without actually the practice? So that's the risky kind of uh, landowner because you're likely to want to sell that land. They can't make money off it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If, and these were distinguished because the um, financial reasons for owning land were higher than any other reason, and not just by a small amount, by a considerable amount. Right? Yeah, well, the contrary, if they want to serve, would be likely to sell it, and maybe that's an opportunity. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. It's more about options. They appreciate the natural resources and they appreciate the fact that they probably can take advantage of that yeah. financially or otherwise. Okay, so working with landowners, we've been told that this picture doesn't really fit very well. So after we discuss the category, if anyone has any stock photos. Oh, actually, it's not that picture. The picture's in here. Oh, it's in here. It's in here. Sorry, it's in here. Especially okay. people who really work with farmers, they say, that's not a real farmer. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that's not a farmer looks like. But, um, so these uh, working the landowners are um, uh, enjoy recreating on their property, so hunting and fishing. They like to go out and be busy on their land. Sometimes they're doing things that are, are really helpful, and sometimes they're doing things that aren't necessarily very good for the property, but they're out doing stuff. Um, so they may have fixed ideas about what is good for their woods and feel that they know best. They may have mistrust of authority and expertise, um, or mistrust of anyone who's promoting a particular ideology or interest. So they may um, be particularly uh, wary of you know, folks from the government coming onto their lands. Um, I think these tend to differ a lot regionally, I think their, their attitude natural resource professionals. Um, sometimes we go places and folks say, oh no, we have a very good relationship with this type of landowner, and sometimes they say, we can't go anywhere near the property. So, yeah. I just have a question about the overall viewers of landowners. Are there a lot of um, owners who are actually, let's say, small farmers, they want to farm, and part of the land is wooded, and part of it is devoted to another uh, developed use in the sense that the land is not forested? Uh, or are we talking about parcels that are primarily completely forested? Well, we're talking about both. And we do, we do have a question on the survey that asks if the, um, if the woods are attached to a farm. And when we give you the state-specific data, I didn't include it here for time, but you can see the numbers of folks who have a farm attached to their woodlands. Sometimes it's you know, farm and woods, and often it's more woods around the farm. So maybe the farmer just put a plow. So the survey um, asked them to answer the survey with respect to the wooded part of their land. Now, that doesn't mean they do, because you don't know what kind of mindset people are in when they're answering the questions. But that's, so these are people who own land with woods in general. Um, and we find in some places a lot of them are farmers, sometimes they're ranchers, sometimes not. You know, this area is less likely. But the 40 plus acre parcel, or 10 plus acre parcel, is acres of woodland yeah. or just? No, woodland. Oh. Yeah. Um, okay, the last category is uninvolved owners. Um, these owners give low importance ratings to all reasons for owning wood. Um, as a result, they're a pretty difficult group to understand. They're also a very diverse group. Um, a classic example of an uninvolved owner that Brett often gives is um, maybe a, a, a woman whose husband was very invested in the property, he was in his family for many years, and he's passed away. So she um, may not have been as involved in the decisions, and as a result, you know, has some 
emotion, some emotional attachment to the property, but is mostly very uninvolved. Um, I think we've met a lot of folks like that in, in focus groups. Um, but this is a very diverse category and difficult um, to, to wrap our heads around. We're currently uh, working on a report that um, will hopefully shed a little light on um, absentee landowners, and some of those, uh, not most, but some of those were uninvolved, and we're getting some Regionally, how these uh, categories shake 